Hey, yo! From the kingdom of Ohio, this is O'Culture. I am Ryan Beverly. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. My guest this episode, Linda Radish, author of The Old Magic of Christmas, a book that explores the darker side of the Yuletide holiday. My conversation with Linda is coming up in just a few moments, but first, the Christmas star may not be a star at all. This story comes to us from the news department at the University of Notre Dame, where Grant Matthews, a professor of theoretical astrophysics and cosmology, has put forth new evidence that the origin of the famed Star of Bethlehem, aka the Christmas Star, which has confounded scientists for centuries, may not be a star at all. Matthews, who has spent more than a decade studying the origins of the mysterious star, including historical, astronomical, and biblical records, believes the event that led the Magi, the Zoroastrian priests of ancient Babylon and Mesopotamia, was an extremely rare planetary alignment that occurred in the year 6 BC, the likes of which may never be seen again. During this alignment, the Sun, Jupiter, the Moon, and Saturn were all in Aries, while Venus was next door in Pisces, and Mercury and Mars were on the other side in Taurus. At the time, Aries was also the location of the vernal equinox. Now, the presence of Jupiter and the Moon signified the birth of a ruler with a special destiny. Saturn was a symbol of the giving of life, as was the presence of Aries in the vernal equinox, also marking the start of spring. That the alignment occurred in Aries, Matthew said, signified a newborn ruler in Judea. The Magi would have seen this in the east and recognized that it symbolized a regal birth in Judea, ultimately leading them in search of the newborn ruler, Matthew said. Now, based on Matthew's calculations, it will be 16,000 years before a similar alignment is seen again. And even then, the vernal equinox would not be in Aries. So running calculations forward, Matthews couldn't find an alignment like the one known as the Bethlehem Star going out as far as 500,000 years. Matthew said, quote, I feel a kindred connection to these ancient magi who earnestly scan the heavens for insight into the truth about the nature and evolution of the universe, just as we do today. Matthews is currently at work on a book about his findings, and who knows, he may wind up on a future episode of this show. Now, this is a fitting news item for this particular episode. Tis the season, after all, and regardless of your personal religious beliefs and how they may apply to the holiday season, it's no secret that American culture has roots in many ancient traditions from across the globe, and nowhere is that more evident than at Christmas time. Whether it's hanging stockings in front of a fireplace or leaving treats out on Christmas Eve for midnight visitors, the history of our Yuletide traditions dates back many centuries to lands far and wide, and it is these traditions that are the subject of The Old Magic of Christmas, a book authored by my guest, Linda Radish. Linda is an eclectic writer with an interest in the practical aspects of prehistory, history, and religion. She writes and lectures on a wide variety of arcane topics, She's a longtime library employee and a professional craft instructor who teaches classes on candle making, broom making, and other old time homemaking arts. This book was published uh, about three years ago, but obviously it's still relevant. It is timeless, much like our holiday traditions. It's an introduction to some and a reminder to others that Yuletide was as much a chilling season of ghosts and witches as it was a festival of goodwill. Now, I did talk with Linda on a cell phone, so I cleaned up the quality of the conversation as much as I could. Regardless, it's a fine chat about supernatural spirits, psychedelic shamans, and those three magi that I mentioned earlier. So let's set the mood, shall we? Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. What fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way Oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse, horse, horse Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way oh, what fun it is to ride in a one-horse open sleigh Through the snow, in a one-horse 
Lions open sleigh. Today, the fields we go. Laughing all the way. Bells on bobtail ring, making our spirits bright. What fun it is to ride and sing a sleighing song tonight. Right, I'm here with Linda Radish. Linda, hey, how are you? Hi, good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Is this still a good time? Yeah, this is perfect. I'm I'm all set up. Oh, good. I have my cough drops. I have to get my ear. There's my cough drops. Oh, okay. do you have a cold? No, no, just in case, because I don't usually talk to people very much, so you know. Are you pretty antisocial or what? Uh, I try to be. <laughs> yeah, I try to be. I don't blame but, you, man. Uh, yeah. I don't blame you. Can I ask you something then? Are you a practicing witch? I am not a practicing witch. I am like caught between a rock and a crystal orb most of the time. Like, there's two kinds. Of, it seems like, I don't know where my kind of people are in the world. Maybe you're one of them. Uh, maybe not. I don't know. People ask me, you know, oh, well, no, nobody ever asked me. If it comes out somehow that I've written a book and they say, what? you know, what do you write about? And I said, well, you have, you know, one on witches is obscure holiday in the springtime, and then I have one about witches and ghosts at Christmas. And they either say, oh, she's a witch, step away from her, or they react, oh, that's really cool. Um, I'm going to a Reiki workshop this weekend. Do you want to come? Or would you like to come see my psychic? Uh, I'm going to a crystal fair. And I'm neither of those kind of people. You know, when my pen when my pen touches the paper, witches and ghosts come out of it. That's just I don't know because I've always been been fascinated by them. Whether or not they're actually real, I like to hear reports from people who are trying to find out if they're actually real. But I'm not so concerned myself. I just like them because of sort of the richness they they add to life and they add to stories and what they kind of tell us about themselves. Um, but no, not a practicing witch. I'm more of a secular humanist. Has to be a scientific explanation most of the time kind of person. So you, you um, wrote these books. I mean, I've only read The Old Magic of Christmas. I know you wrote the other one on, was it Walpurgis Night? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you said it right. Yes, yes. You know how you, you see words, but you never heard anybody say those words out loud. Like um, Tatagalan Igerna, the, the Cornish castle where King Arthur was conceived, and his mother was Igerna, and for years and years and years I was, I was saying Pentagal and Ebrain until I, you know, saw some, something, I think it was a Michael Wood uh, show, you know, when they were looking for the Holy Grail, mm -hmm. and you see the, for the English person pronouncing it correctly, and oh, yeah, so, but generally in German, the G is going to be hard. Yeah, that's kind of what I thought. Um, well, that, and I think just looking at it, that's just how it seems like it would be. Like, I don't know how you would pronounce it any other way. Yeah, well, people like to say Walpurgis. Oh, Walpurgis. Well, well, oh, okay. Yeah. Well. Mm -hmm. In German, it's Walpurgis. But The Old Magic of Christmas, I re largely wrote for my 13-year-old self because I think that's the, one of the, that's the book I would have been looking for at that age when I had started like to get this inkling that there was another kind of Christmas. I already knew that there were two kinds of Christmas. There was the American Christmas that was going on outside, and then there was the German Christmas that we celebrated at home, although it wasn't purely German anymore because we, we opened one, like one present on Christmas Eve and then the rest of the presents on Christmas morning. But we definitely had a different aesthetic for the German Christmas. And then around the age of 13, I was really realizing, oh, every so often there'd be a reference to, to Fern the Hunter or uh, you know, werewolves, wolves at Christmas. And I thought, wait, there's, there's another Christmas out there that I don't know about. So I've really written this hoping that, you know, the 13-year-olds who are out there or, you know, and older, maybe a little secret 13-year-olds, uh, 
but it'll get into their hands and they'll be inspired. So if you're not a practicing witch, where did the interest in this sort of subject matter start for you then? Let's see. Well, the, the original dream was to write fantasy novels. And I've written two and a half unpublished fantasy novels. And I had to do a lot of research to make as I, uh, I, I, write a, I write fantasy. I don't read a lot of fantasy. I read some realistic fiction. I read mostly nonfiction. But I like I love Tolkien. I like the first three books of the Chronicles of Narnia. And so I grew up with those. And I thought, well, I have to write about fantasy because I don't know enough about the real world. But then I found to write fantasy, if you're going to try to write good fantasy, you have to do even more research to make your fantasy world believable. And so I think, especially with the, the half-finished novel, I was spending a lot of time, uh, what were their clothes made out of? And what kind of weaving techniques did they have? Did they have a, a freight loom or a horizontal loom? And, you know, what did they believe? Were they, I've always thought that witches were cool. I think because of the hat, I know that sounds shallow. I think it, <laughs> the hat is something, you know, like Let the Flying Nun. It was the hat. There's something about the hat. Yeah. And, and the long dress, there's just that that image. So uh, researching where does that, you know, if we want to have witches in our fantasy novel, well, you know, where do witches come from? And, um, and it turns out that dramatic witches generally do not wear pointy hats. They wear kerchiefs. So all this research I was doing and all this actual writing I was not doing. And then um, my friend Wendy Mass, well, did you have kids? Do I have kids? Do you have kids? No, no, I, no, I don't. No, no. Okay, so then you won't. You probably won't have heard of Wendy Mass. She uh, writes middle grade uh, novels. And, but before her first middle grade novel was published, she was writing school library market books. Uh, the kind that, you know, you have to do a report on Stonehenge and there's, oh, here's a, you know, one written just for me. I'm in fifth grade. Here's something I can read on the, the whole book on Stonehenge. So she was doing that kind of thing. And then she uh, was working on a book called, what did we call it? That was like Halloween uh, for fifth and sixth graders. And she was getting busy with her fiction. So she actually had me finish it. She paid me to finish it. She couldn't, she tried to get my name credited to it. She couldn't, but she did make a nice little dedication and she paid me. So, so doing Celebrate Halloween, I thought, well, this is fun, but it would be fun. It, it's constraining writing for the fifth, fifth, fifth graders. Uh, there are, you know, limitations. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, it'd be fun to write a book. And I had heard about Walt Purvis Knight kind of fleetingly. Uh, it'd be cool to write a book like this about Walpurgis Night, but not have to write it for fifth and sixth graders, writing it for teens on up. And, you know, then I I could just be kind of wild and creative. So that was the first book. And after I wrote that one, I thought, well, I really want to get into all the cool Christmas traditions, which I had every year since I was about 13, almost every year. Um, I've made my own Christmas cards. So for the other 11 months of the year, I'm always searching for an image. And so really the research from, for the Christmas book started back when I was a teenager looking for cool images. And, you know, I've, I've put, uh, first I used to do little medieval people. Then one year I saw a medieval Finnish dress in an exhibit at the Museum of Natural History, and I thought, oh, Hans Christian Andersen, Finnmark woman from the, the fairy tale The Snow Queen. Mm-hmm. There's a brief character, there's a brief appearance called the Finnmark woman. But, okay, she would look cool in that dress, so I uh, threw her in that dress, and she was on Christmas cards one year. And then one time, Smithsonian had an article about strange Bavarian folk characters and one of them was the Putenmandel, who there are, I guess, 12 of them. 
who come down from the mountains and generally terrorize the village at St. Nicholas Day for fun. And they're wrapped up in a sheaf of a harvested sheaf of wheat, and they have these big cowbells around their waist, and, you know, they look like something from another world. So one year I got the Wooten on the lawn and an ink sketch of him on my, my Christmas card. And so it grew out of um, not any desire to do magic or to be, you know, weirder than I already am, but just a fascination with these old traditions that people don't know about. And some of them, even we don't know about them, we're still doing them, but we don't know why we're doing them. I'd like to know why people do what they do and why they no longer do what they do. So it's more sort of like a, a, the history and sort of like the deep, the deep things in the psyche. And then when you get into the, the parallels, you find, you know, the same character is, is popping up in India is, and popping up in Europe. And why is that? Is it because they cross paths or is it something deep in the psyche or did it travel with the language? So, yeah, it's kind of like excavating through these, these old books. So when you started to research these old traditions, you probably found really early on that Christmas, as we celebrate it, goes back way before Christianity, right? Well, it does and it doesn't. I was, I was surprised at a lot of the things I found. Some of the things were a lot more recent than I thought. And some of the things that I thought were recent turned out to be a lot older, like the... Um, the Lucia figure in Sweden. They also do it to some degree in Denmark and Norway. And a little bit in the Lily, she seems to fall by the wayside in Iceland. But she dresses up. It's, it's uh, usually one one daughter per household, and each company will have its own Lucia. And on December 13th, which in the old calendar was the winter solstice, she dresses in a, a white robe with a red sash. She wears a crown of real live candles on her head and she carries she goes around she usually has a, a procession of with people holding candles with her and she distributes saffron buns sometimes coffee you think that's really old right you think oh you know the solstice the sun maybe she's like a sacro maybe she represented you know in the old days they would sacrifice a virgin to the sun this has got to be ancient but it's not that ancient it dates from the Reformation. Really? When, hmm. Yes, because uh, Martin Luther said, you know, okay, we're, we're going to clean up the church, we're going to reform it, and ended up founding Protestantism, and we're not going to have St. Nicholas distributing the gifts anymore. We're going to have the Christ child himself handing out the gifts. So usually... The, you know, just like in, in Shakespeare, all the girls used to be played by boys. For some mm-hmm. reason, the Christ child was always played by, almost always played by a girl. And so I think people after a while forgot that he was even supposed to be a Christ child, and it turned out looking more like a bride figure. And the Swedes adopted that figure. That Then they that became their, their Santa Lucia, who was a Christian saint, but she also seems to be related to this older, not nicer witch, Lucy, L-U-S-S-I, who made an appearance at that time of the year, and she might come down the chimney. And interesting enough, the, the buns that the Lucia figure distributes to people are called Lucy cats, even though the normal bun does not look like a cat. It's just sort of a cinnamon bun shape kind of thing. So it's like, okay, there's also a witch named Lucy, and this one is handing out cats. And the goddess Freya, her, she had a, um, a cart pulled by cats. So it's a lot, a lot of things mixed up. But she, she didn't really crystallize until after the Reformation. And then on the flip side of her, you have the Italian witch Bafana, mm-hmm. who uh, she gives out her presence later at... Um, Tiffany, the, the night, the eve of January 6th, because she was, she seems to be totally Christian. Um, the story is that she was cleaning her house, presumably somewhere in Italy, 
when the three wise men passed by and they were following the star to Bethlehem and they, I guess, had lost her way. They asked if she knew the way and I guess she pointed them. They asked her, do you want to come with us? And she said, I with you, I've got to clean this house. So they moved on and the sauna, while she's sweeping, she has second thoughts. And she decides she really does want to come with them. She makes some cookies for this special child that they're going to go visit. And by the time she gets out on the road, she can't find them. And so she's spent the past 2,000-some years uh, flying around on her broomstick looking for the Christ child. And she, every January 6th, which is the day that the three kings arrived in Bethlehem, she drops presents down the chimney just in case the Christ child happens to be living in that house so he'll get his presents. And that seems to be totally, totally Christian. But the sauna has a lot in common with uh, Bertha, the, the goddess named Bertha, or sometimes known as Perchta, who was an ancient Germanic goddess. And to have her, her special time was during the winter, and she may be linked to the goddess Frigga, who I sometimes refer to as Frigga slash Freya. Freya was the goddess of love. Frigga was the wife of Odin. But they could, they, you know, they overlap. They overlap a lot there. So, so, but, so things that you think are really old aren't necessarily, and things that you think are new and totally Christian sometimes turn out not to be. You know, I thought Bufana was the most interesting story in this book. Because, yeah, and I'll tell you why. Because when I was reading it, okay, so full disclosure, I hadn't heard of this story prior to reading your book. So, I always like it when somebody said, Oh, I've never heard of this. Yeah, so Bafana, completely new to me. But as I was reading through the book, or through her story in the book, I hopped online and I was doing some further reading and. You know, so, like you said, she was visited by the three wise men, right? Mm -hmm. But another name for the three wise men, at least in uh, older times, I guess, were the three magi. Yes. Persian Persian wizards. Yeah, and so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so magi comes from magic, right? I don't think... Well, actually, magic comes from from magi, from the Zoroastrian priests. Okay, so I had it backwards then, but... So we have, I, th- I think we have essentially three magicians who are visiting her. That the three wise men are actually three magicians. Is this a stretch to say that? Um, magicians slash astrologers. Right, okay. Slash priests, yeah. So is it possible that the three wise men, the three magi, that they are essentially... Maybe the three hermetic traditions of alchemy, astrology, and magic together? Oh, I don't know. That's like high magic. I don't know a lot about high magic. I know more about like the folky stuff. Right. That's a nice idea. That's a nice idea. Another thing about the magi... They probably would have had, they may have had pointy hats or at least high hats. That's another thing that seems to have come from the whole, like, Indo-European toolkit is the the hats going along with power, supernatural power. Right. Going back, not just to the Zoroastrians who were, how old were they? I think officially from the first century B.C., early first century B.C., but even going back to the the early Indo-Iranian cult and the Hittites, the Hittites who live in what is now Turkey, was the center of their kingdom, they were Indo-European speakers, and you see a lot of high-hatted priests and gods and goddesses on there, the carvings that they left behind. So I think the Magi are a direct, direct descendant of those those holy people. All right, so I just pulled it up, and now this is according to Wikipedia, so we, we don't really know if this is true or not. But yeah, we got to take it with a grain of salt. Okay. Right, right, right. So they say their roots possibly date back to the second millennium BCE, 
but that they enter recorded history in the 5th century BCE. Yeah, that's the Magi? That's Zoroastrianism that's in general. Okay. Yeah. And Zoroaster was like, he was kind of like the Martin Luther of his time, because like, as just as Martin Luther didn't want to, he wasn't trying to set up a new sect. He just wanted to clean up the Catholic Church and, and get it what he thought was, was back on track. And Zoroaster... I think at that time, the, the priest, the Persian priest, had become very powerful, and he wanted to, I think, put people more, the worshippers more in direct contact with the gods, and he was trying to clean up early Persian religion, but it ended up becoming its own, its own a religion on its own, break away. And, and we do still have Zoroaster. We don't have... Um, I don't think we have any representatives of that first, you know, the early Persian religion, but we do, and a lot of it survives in Zoroastrianism. Mm -hmm. They are some, there's like a handful still in Iran, and most of them I think are in India, and then dispersed throughout the world. Well, you can't convert to it. You can't, oh, I I didn't know that. Yeah, I can't take converts. So you just have to be born into it then? You have to be born into it. Okay. Well, that's a pretty exclusive club then. It is a pretty exclusive. Yeah, it is a pretty exclusive club. Well, you know, I want to go back to my hermetic analogy there because I've been reading about hermeticism a lot in my personal life recently. So it's that's why it's, I think, top of mind with me. Mm-hmm. But the reason that I brought that up was because of the Magi, you know, seeing the star of Bethlehem, this this star rising, right? And I right. immediately they were, they were astrologers. Yeah, they were astrologers. They were. But I, I immediately equated that to the sun and them, you know, kind of of flocking toward the sun. And then when they get there, the Christ child would be to me like maybe sort of a Christ consciousness, that sort of a symbol for it, maybe. And then I was well, thinking about what they gifted to, you know, gold, which is tied with alchemy, and then I didn't make any good connections with the other two. Frankincense and myrrh don't really have anything to do with astrology and magic, but I don't know. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to bust your bubble, but no, please bust it. The, yeah. Because the other two, okay, frankincense and myrrh are resin of trees that mm-hmm. were burned as incense, and some people think, and I tend to agree that okay, you've got what you've got two resins all the very precious resins, and then you've got gold, that the gold may actually have been the resin of the golden balsam tree. Okay. And it was actually all three were bringing them in in, in incense. But nobody knows for sure. Well, we don't know if that story is even true at all. That's that's the thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I kind of tend to think it's not. I mean, it's a good story. It has all the components of a good story, so it... it, uh, survive but now if they're going toward the sun now my geography is not what it should be well wait a minute no hold on if if they're visiting Bafana, who's in italy and they're going towards the sun towards bethlehem they they never actually got to italy okay so the Bafana thing okay because if they were astrologers they would have known how to navigate by the Stars. That's <laughs> true. Yeah, life. that is true. Italy is, you know, is, I think that's just it. Because I mean, it, it, like in, you know, you can go to Iceland, and there's, oh yes, the Holy Family passed through here <laughs> on their way from Bethlehem, going into <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> it makes no so, sense. Yeah. yeah. But if we have the if we have the Magi somewhere in Persia, that's east. That's already east of Bethlehem. So they're going to be traveling. Well, right? Well, here's the thing. They could be astrologers, just the very bad ones. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think they would have earned their hat that way. <laughs> Wait, so they had to earn the hat? I don't know. I don't know for sure. I mean, they would have had to, I think, demonstrate some kind of aptitude. And then, well, but then not all of the, not all of the versions of that story have them. Doesn't one of them having, have them coming from Ethiopia? Because remember, Baltasar... Uh, traditionally, um, Baldassar is always represented as black, as African-looking. Mm-hmm. And he comes into... They, uh, 
in in Europe there often is a dark faced figure at Christmas time, and I sometimes wonder if if Balthazar if, if is he African looking because he actually was from Africa or he was based on some priest in Africa, or because the Europeans felt the need to have a dark faced figure in the Christmas celebration. Hmm. I can't remember what chapter uh, I did in that. And I, I did um I did an interview when the book first came out, I did an interview with someone who shall not be named. Um, <laughs> okay. And the question of Black Peter came up, who is uh now he's in the Netherlands. Saint Nicholas, who is a sort of like a very serious looking bishop who rides on a white horse. He arrives um, late November so that he can, he tours the, the country and then the gifts are given out. Um, he gives some gifts on his saint day, St. Nicholas Day on December 6th. And he's accompanied by Black Peter. And Black Peter traditionally was played in blackface. He had, uh, he was dressed like as a Spanish page from maybe the 1500s, and he was St. Nicholas's sidekick. And while St. Nicholas was being serious and forgiving the children for their sins, St. Nicholas, Black Peter was, you know, he was doing sort of the comic relief. He was uh, threatening to bring the bad, stuff the bad kids in his back and carry them off to Spain, of all things. Oh my God, right? Right. Um, so I, and, I, and I said that Black Peter, they don't really do him anymore in the Netherlands. It's a dying tradition because it's considered, you know, and as a more diverse population, it's considered offensive. And the person who was interviewing me said, oh, well, that's just silly. And then we moved on to another subject. And I wanted to get into it more and say that, yeah, the Black Peter, he seems to be, a, yeah, a virulently racist figure, even though he's, he's a beloved figure by the, by the kids, you know, they, they don't want to get stuff in the sack, but like, oh, there's Peter, it means it's, uh, Christmas is coming and we're going to get presents and look at him, he's funny, but I think he's actually descended from this, this, this much, much older, dark spirit of Christmas that seemed to be popping up when I was doing my research, who, who may represent winter, because um, it seems to be like he's always gone by Christmas time, when the by the winter solstice, when actually the sun comes out. He's popping up in early, late November, early December. Which, when like, have you noticed that the already it's getting dark earlier and earlier? And um, you know, every time I get up, it seems like oh, it's darker longer, and we're yeah. going early bed in the morning. And you have to have the headlights on because it's still dark, and. He, he comes with these darkest days of the year, and then after the winter solstice, he's, he's gone again. And he might also have something to do with the, the spirits in the chimney, because that traditionally was the the, house, the the household gods resided in the hearth, and then when chimneys came along, I think with the Normans, in the chimney. And we still do that, of course. We still make offerings to the household spirits. By, can you think of it? No. <laughs> the the plate of cookies, cookies out for Santa. When you oh were well, kids. yeah. I guess I was trying to think of something that would have went back much older than that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, because I, think it, I mean, I think it does go. It, see, see, that's one of those things that we still do today, and we don't realize how old it is. Because usually, we always put the cookies. We had a fireplace when I was growing up, so the co- plate of cookies went in front of the fireplace, and the Stockings, if you've got a fireplace, that's where the stockings are going to be. But my dad always ate those. Yes, but you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> well, after a while I did, but I mean, it's like, who were we offering them to? My dad would sit down and eat the cookies and the milk. And, I mean, okay, so that's what that's what they told me, you know, like after, so I grew up with a sister, like after my sister and I, you know, stopped believing in Santa... We asked my mom and dad one time, like, well, what happened to all the cookies and the milk? And we would leave carrots out, that's too, it. for, you know, the that reindeer. The she just I said my dad ate them, so. Yeah, I was like, wait, wait a minute, who's been eating those cookies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, maybe because, maybe they didn't, I don't know. I think, 
like maybe as children, because children know a lot more than than grown-ups. They were, okay, so I said I'm not spiritual, but I do think that kids have a line into some other kind of reality that the rest of us have lost. So I think as kids, like, wait a minute, I was involved in a sacred transaction. There is this spirit known as Santa Claus who is not like you and not like me. He has special powers. He is from, he is other. And I am giving him sacred offerings. And then I find out that mom and dad have been eating them. You've, well, no wonder there's no Santa anymore for me because you've, you've broken the, you know, you've broken the sacred ceremony. And actually my, my older daughter was always a little afraid of her stocking. Mm, really? She'd put the, and, you know, she'd hang the, let's see, when we didn't have a fireplace anymore after she was, uh, like, two and a half. So from age two and a half to five, we had no fireplace. So we would hang it on the back, the knob of the back door. And she would hang the stocking on the doorknob Christmas Eve, and it was limp and empty. And, you know, we'd all get up in the morning at the same time. And it was bulging. And you know, I'd say, well, look at that. And she, she would take my hand and say, um, with me. And she was, she was nervous to open that stocking because she knew, you know, it had been filled by supernatural agency. Really? Yeah. That, I mean, that's how she felt, you know, strongly in her mind that this was, um, this was something that happened, you know, you know, once she started opening the package things that were inside the stocking, you know, she got interested in, in, in what it was and she lost her, her fear of it. But it was something not just magical, but something very mysterious and a little bit scary because how did that stuff get in there? You know, you do mention yeah. stockings in the book too, and I, I think you you portray them as a sort of a similar supernatural thing. They hang in front of the fireplace, in the fireplace, the chimney, like you were just saying, is uh, I think in the book you call it, oh, hold on, I actually wrote a note about it. You call it a way to the afterlife and that the fire yeah. that the fireplace is a sacred space and that's why you hang the stockings in, in front of it. So that makes sense that she would, I guess, yeah. have that sort of connection or or have that sort of reaction to that area. To the, I, I just think it's this whole um, mystery thing that we've passed, passed down that we we want to believe that at one point we did believe that there were actual spirits, you know, the ancestral spirits were in the chimney or in the hearth because the hearth was the central uh, center of the home. Mm-hmm. And I think it's interesting that we just, well, you know, some people, for, for us in our family, it was always what's in the stocking is from Santa. What's under the tree is from family. Oh, okay. But the stocking was, and, and, and it's, uh, it was always an extra effort. You had to get different wrapping paper, not let the kids see the wrapping paper because the packages in the stocking had to be wrapped in in a different kind of paper because you wouldn't be using the same wrapping paper that the family is using. Right. And um, just because why do we have, why do we, as parents, we really want to keep this thing going as long as we can. I mean, I know I did. I kept it going longer with my my younger ones, and I don't know when the older one stopped believing I still have to put a stocking out for her, because <laughs> she never actually came came and told me that that she knew the truth, but my younger one, and it was sort of like a traumatic thing when she figured it out, and it was really, really sad when they stopped believing in it. And I wonder why is it so important to us as parents, and why we you know, we still do this stuff. We don't just say, "Hey, here's in fact uh, my younger daughter's father who did not grow up with Christmas. When one Christmas, he just kind of came and you know he, he had package for her, and hey, this is from Santa. <laughs> like, no, no, that's not how it's done. <laughs> We, we do have to, you know, we do the whole ritual because I think we recognize even though we don't necessarily feel it anymore that there is something sacred about about this. And you do have to give 
you know, leave the cookies, or did, did you do carrots for the reindeer also? Oh, sorry, my, my cat just interfered. Um, hold on just oh. a second. So anyways. So <laughs> my cat's being really good. She's sleeping here. Okay, well, my cat is not being good, so... But anyways, oh. yes, we did do carrots for the reindeer. My dad also ate those from what I was told. But back to your point, though, you know, I think it's believing in Santa Claus when you're a kid is like believing in magic, right? I mean, it how... is. yeah, because I remember thinking, oh, you know, this magic's not real. Oh, but wait, there is magic because there's Santa Santa magic. So yeah, I mean, well. how else do you get across the world in one night? You've got to have some sort of magician's touch to that, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, we came up with, because we watch a lot of Doctor Who, I came up with that it was, he had, um, special group up at his his headquarters, the Time Elves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And he, he himself didn't understand how he did it. He asked them, but they uh, they were not, they didn't volunteer any information. Because so, we actually got, um, my younger daughter had a correspondence going with Santa Claus. Oh, really? A lot of work, but still I miss it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, can we talk about some of the other stories in the book that are um, more traditional and kind of their origins that are still sort of practiced or characters that, that still pop up in traditional American celebrations? You know, we talked about St. Nicholas, you know, like I think most people are familiar with that character. You know, you hear jolly old St. Nick that's in, in songs and celebrations all throughout the Christmas season. Let's talk about something like the elves. Where do the elves come from? I think, in a nutshell, the elves are the dead. Okay. Because they were they were not um, elves were not originally small. You know, a lot of these elves generally can be equated with fairies, and just as the fairies had to shrink in order to survive in the world, I think the elves also had to had to shrink in order to survive in the modern world and, and become, you know, something just for kids. The elves originally were not for kids. The elves were, um, in Scandinavia, they, the elves have become, uh, the Nis, in the Nis in Danish, the Thompson in, uh, Swedish. And he, um, they didn't do stockings by the fireplace in Scandinavia or in or in Germany. Um, in Scandinavia they leave a bowl of porridge in the barn. If you if you live in the country it's gonna be in the barn. Otherwise it's gonna be a room in the house and the bowl of porridge is left for the nest, who is a, a tiny old man with a beard and a cap and probably descended because then there's another ah, there's another figure at the in the garden, and I forget his name, and he was actually a giant who had to be, um, you know, soothed with offerings. So the the Scandinavian elf, which is a, the Nith, is may represent the, the founder of the house, the ancestor of the house, maybe the first person who cut down the trees in the 1300s and established the farmstead. So their, their elves have, have shrunken in that way question is how did we get our garish you know green felt wearing toy shop elves that make toys i'd like to i'd like to know exactly like how far the the toy making elf goes back yeah i don't i I don't know you know like i mean most of it when we, we we think of the ones in rudolph but when Rudolph was made in 19, 1950-something or 1960-something, how old was it at that time? Well, we've got, like, the elves and the shoemaker. They were that going back to the 1800s. I think, I think you know, the elves were their own thing. And then St. Nicholas is, you know, partly partly a an actual Christian saint, the, the one who put the those boys together who were cut up and put in a pickle jar and um, not pickle jar, pickle barrel and I think he also helped some poor girl who didn't have a dowry and he gave her, you know, left gold in her house so she would have a dowry where were they going with this? <laughs> I think somehow they just had to they just had to hook up yeah. um, you know, 
know, how can Santa do all this work for himself? How can he make all these toys and wrap them and deliver them? Well, he's got elves to help him. Well, I mean, whoever yeah. built the modern Christmas tradition obviously just cut and pasted from all these other different stories from different cultures to make this one story that we now know that we grew up with. Yeah, and it's very distinct. I think our story is very distinctively American. Mm-hmm. Like even like down to the cookies. Did you know that we the reason that we eat cookies and the British eat biscuits is because cookies is actually is originally a Dutch word. So we get that from the Dutch in New Amsterdam, which is now New York. Right. And we get a lot of our Saint Nicholas tradition also from those same Dutch colonists. So again, yeah, ours, and then we have a little bit of the Germanic, the Bell's Nickel who was the St. Nicholas uh, uh, the Germans brought with them to Pennsylvania. And he would, you would get, no, actually, it's not like usually, uh, you know, you get whipped if you're bad, you get cookies if you're good, but the bell's nickel will be like, reach for the cookies, I'll whip you, and then I'll withdraw and you can pick them up and enjoy them. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, so let's talk about reindeer. There's an interesting story in here about reindeer sacrifice. Could you talk about that? That was hard to find information on. Um, and somebody somebody recently sent me a Facebook message saying you know, they just read about the that section, the Yuletide people, and they wanted to know more about it. And I was like, well, pretty much everything that I found out about it is, is in the book. And it was the, the laps who were... The, their own name is, which is now the one used, is, is Sami, the people who live in the far north of uh, Norway and Finland and Sweden. And they herd reindeer uh, for food, for a living. But they also have, like, this very sort of loving relationship with the, the reindeer. And so reindeer, even to this day, are kind of half wild. You know, they run around all summer, and then they, they hook them up and, and bring them in, in in the winter, you know, move them from pasture to pasture so where they can kind of lichen that they need to eat. And so the Sami at Christmas time would sacrifice a reindeer and put all the, the things in a basket, the, the meat and other other food in a basket, and then hoist the basket into a tree, and that offering was for the Yuletide people, as they call them. And it's not entirely clear who the root Yuletide people are. They may have something to do with the wild hunt. Have you heard of the wild hunt? Yes. Yeah, the wild hunt is, is um, for people like me who write the kind of books I do, they can be very frustrating because at times it seems like, oh my gosh, I've, I've, I've researched spectral dogs and and the, the witch goddess Perkta and then the reindeer and... and there's times where it's like, oh, well, it's the wild hunt. It all goes back to the wild hunt. Well, the wild hunt, I mean, it just seems to be like every time you research something, it goes back to the wild hunt. And that was this this uh, group of restless souls. Sometimes it was, uh, usually like in, in Germany and France, it was some guy who loved hunting so much, he insisted on hunting a, a, at the Sabbath, so when he died, he was doomed to hunt forever. Mm-hmm. And they go, go, you know, rampaging through through the woods and dark roads in the forest, um, especially at Christmas time. And it may go all the way back to Odin, the the god of magic and of death, kind of a, the king of the Scandinavian, the Norse god, leading his retinue through the sky or through the woods at, at the winter time. And so there pe- people, sometimes you think like, well, the Sami speak a language related to Finnish and also related to the, the Samoyed people in Western Siberia, distantly related to Hungarian, but, but they kind of class there. Okay, they're, they're one tradition, non-Indo-European tradition, probably had been where they are since the end of the last Ice Age, and, and that's them. And then you have the Germanic people with their own set of gods, and that's them, and they stay separate. But I, there was a lot of uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of contact between the Germanic people in the area. 
um, and the Sami. So I think, you know, they could have made... There's a theory that Odin, the god Odin, may have actually come out of that reindeer herding tradition into, to then, you know, become king of the Norse gods, or the Sami could have borrowed elements of the Norse religion, and uh, that the, the Yulpai people are actually originally a, a Germanic thing of, of Odin's retinue. But uh, everything gets so, so tangled up. Like you have in the sagas, often if somebody's lost something or somebody wants some, some specifical magical mission carried out, they'll ask either, they call them Finns, usually in the sagas. Anybody who's a Finn might just as easily be a, a Laplander, a Sami, and uh, like in one language, the, the Finns are Finns and the Sami are referred to as Finns on skis. And they were supposed to be very good at going into trance, at sending their spirit somewhere far away, even as far away as Iceland, and they could locate lost objects, they could spy on people that way. And, oh, but we were talking about reindeer, weren't we? Well, or, yeah, and, well, you mentioned the, the Sami. That was the group that sacrificed the reindeer in some sort of ritual that I found to be very weird. I, I never heard that before. Yeah, it was cutting off the, the special sacrifice was the, the reindeer's lips. Yeah, <laughs> what was that about? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I would like to. I put in the book as much as I could, as I could dig up on it. The trail seemed to go cold with a German guy named Ernst Mopper, Ernst Mopper, I think, who wrote a he he wrote a book about the lapse. Um, people. Eight seasons, and yeah, Ernst Bunker, M A N K E R, and he was writing in the fifties, and he wrote. He he spent a lot of time among the Sami, and he wrote as if he may have actually have witnessed the ceremony. Nowadays, the Sami, even in the by the fifties, by the late Middle Ages, the Sami were well, maybe by the fifteen hundreds, they were all Christianized. But of course, they've kept just as everybody else has. They've kept a lot of the old. Traditions, but but the, the, even the this hoisting of a basket for the Yuletide people as a sacrifice to the Yuletide type people in a tree—that's not that different from the cookies to uh, Santa Claus for the fireplace. Again, right. somebody always has to leave something out. You got to leave something out for someone on Christmas Eve, whether it's the reindeer lips or the cookies or the bowl of porridge in the stable. Seems like if you want to get something back. You have to put something out, and not even just to get something back, but just so the disaster doesn't strike the family and the household. That there's dangerous things, just like on Halloween, there's dangerous things out there at this time of year. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And I want to talk about the yeah. dark, the dark side of Christmas in a second. I first though want to ask you if you're familiar with the. I think it's a more recent theory about the flying reindeer and how they might have been tripping on magic mushrooms. Have you yeah, heard that? I've heard a lot about that. Somebody, who was it? Somebody, I think, did an exaggerated, I saw them say something, an exaggerated version of how, like, absolutely everything, that we hang the stockings by the fire because they would gather the, the hallucinogenic mushrooms and then dry them by the fire so they could use them and go into trance. And I've heard all kinds of things, like the, the reason that Santa wears a red coat trimmed with white fur. Have you heard this one? No. Oh, it's because it's the skin from a freshly sacrificed sheep. Oh. So he has the bloody, you know, the bloody inner side face out and then the fleece turned up at the cut. And I think, I might, I mean, there could be a grain of truth to these things here or there, but the whole idea of Santa as a shaman is more about us right now than it does about anything that was happening then. Because the thing is, okay, if if Santa comes down from pre-Christian shamanic tradition, complete with the, the, the red coat with the white fur, tripping on the mushrooms, so that he has the experience of flying. And, and, you know, in those 
Siberian to Sami cultures, there was there there was the there were flying reindeer. Yes, I mean we've seen um, reindeer and and red deer, which is the kind of deer that that lives in Siberia. We've seen them carved on really really old stones in Central Asia, and often they they look like you know they're they're very very slowly and beautiful, and they look like they are ascending into the air, and there may be those things are 2,000 or more years old, some of those those carved stones. But if, Santa, if, the, if our whole Santa on a flying reindeer package goes back to that, where was he between, like, the first millennium B.C. and when Clement was it Miles, I always, Clement Moore, when Clement Moore wrote Who's so the Night Before Christmas? Because we don't have, we don't have St. Nick riding on reindeer, or not just riding on reindeer, but, you know, being pulled by a reindeer in those, in those years in between, you know? So I'm thinking we should, there should be a clear trail between ancient shamanic Siberian traditions and Twas the night before Christmas when he lands on the rooftop with his plane his reindeer, and we we don't have that. It's a very broken chain. It's it's kind of like the whole uh, Wicca movement, where in the starting in, in about the nineteen twenties, they said, oh, you know, witchcraft. All those people who were burned as witches in the fifteen and sixteen hundreds, they were actually practitioners of an ancient religion, and going all the way back to the Stone Age. And that was a very romantic idea, a very, you know, attractive idea. Wow, this religion linking us to our ancestors all the way back then. If we could practice it again, that would be great. But I think even um, modern card-carrying practicing witches that you talk to today, most of them don't still believe that. Somehow the, the modern religion of witchcraft works for them. It does something for them. But usually they don't subscribe to, to Margaret Murray's idea that that it came from all that was preserved through all those thousands of years. And I think the fact that in the in the 1920s and, and then, you know, reaching a height in, in the 60s, the 50s and 60s, that, that idea was so appealing. Wow, this pre, pre-agricultural, pre-industrial religion survives and we can still tap into it. That says more about the people alive at that time, mm-hmm. you know, in the early 20th century, what they wanted, what they needed, and... I think the idea that of Santa Claus as an ancient pre-Christian shaman says more about us right now, too, what we want, what we need. So it's attractive, but I don't really subscribe to the idea. Well, there's an interesting connection to Rudolph. Just real quick to wrap up the reindeer talk here. Rudolph's nose is red. And supposedly the mushroom that these that these shamans from these Siberian tribes were consuming were red mushrooms. They were the Amanita muscaria. Have you heard of that? Muscaria. Mm-hmm. Yes, Amanita muscaria. And that's still, uh, it's the red with the white spots. Yeah. And in German, it's called the Glückstil, a lucky mushroom. Um, but don't, don't go out and try to eat them. Um, and they still, like if you get a your typical German birthday card, um, we'll have a horseshoe, a couple four-leaf clovers, and a couple lucky mushrooms. And we still put them, most of them are broken, but we still put glass, blown glass mushrooms uh, on our Christmas tree. Really? Yeah. In fact, m- most of them have broken, so my daughter actually, she knit a couple <laughs> omelette and muscaria to put on the mushroom, on the Christmas tree uh, last year. Uh, but yes. Yeah, those mushrooms are, are lucky symbols and Christmas symbols in Germany. And I think I think that, that they go back. Yeah, I think they definitely go back. It, it could also be that they just look pretty. They're red and white. They're very appealing looking. And that's something that did not, I don't know of any Americans who put mushrooms on the Christmas tree. Well, I don't, but I do have a blown glass mushroom on my bookshelf right now, but it's green. Oh, where'd you get it? Well, my my ex-girlfriend made it for me, and... Oh, she was a glass blower, and you let her go? Well, you know, it's a long story, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
but that um, be another episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a bit more personal of a story, I think. But uh, no, yeah, she made it for me. Well, I mean, she made quite a few of them and and handed them out to friends and family. So I just had one, and it's been sitting on the bookshelf, you know, for years. It's green. It's green. Well, yeah, she made several different colors. I don't, I, don't, I don't think there are green mushrooms. I don't think mushrooms can. Well, I mean, there aren't there mushrooms. aren't blue ones either. I don't think, but she no. <laughs> she made blue ones. No, so I mean, yeah, it's green. just it's just a it's just all different colors. I don't know why I got a green one. I I didn't ask at the time, but going back to go ahead. To Rudolph. Yeah. Yeah, we have to. We've got. I mean, we've got to blow that one out of the water. Okay. Rudolph is what nineteen thirty something. Rudolph does not go far back at all. Right. He, it was the guy, Robert, I forget his name. I think his wife had, had, wife had died of cancer. He had a daughter. They didn't have much money. And he wrote this song, sold the song. And I don't think he ever got much royalty. So for, originally Rudolph was a song. And that, you know, just, just, you know, became wildly popular. I think that was either in the 20s or the 30s. No earlier than that. And then I actually found a book at the library, a picture book, that was about Rudolph helping Santa deliver toys. And he was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. He was helping Santa deliver the toys. But then I think at the end, Rudolph goes to his own house and he gets in bed, and he gets toys too. And there's no, um, there's no Christmas Town. I don't think there are any elves. There's Rudolph and Santa, and it's obviously this book was written between the song coming out and between the TV Christmas special coming out. And then, then the Christmas special was made based on the song, and saw it. And it's supposed to be the song with John. Oh, I think no, I think the 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 sad guy, the sad widower. I think he wrote it maybe as a poem. But I think we can safely say that Rudolph's nose is not a mushroom. It's not an almond. He did need a mascara of mushroom. Right. I don't think that the guy who wrote that was or Johnny Marks or anybody was tapping into that. So yeah, I think we can safely. Let that one go, although people might be sad. Well, either way, I'm going to leave out some magic mushrooms on Christmas Eve for myself. Okay. That's and a whole let other... us know yeah. what you see. There was actually, I'm really bad at reading the Norse myths. Like, usually, like, I, found, I find out there's something in one of the, in one of the sagas. I'm pretty good with the myths, but the, the Icelandic and the Norse sagas, you know, the actual semi-historical exploits of people. I would say, like, I'm going to read the sagas of the Icelanders, like, cover to cover, and it doesn't happen. And I end up just kind of, I've read a couple of them all the way through. Like, Njal Saga, that's a good one. Laxdala Saga, that's what that's got, like, a zombie in it. That's a good one. But there's one that, like, I came across it a long time ago, and I was never able to find it again. There is one where somehow somebody's corpse, and they're kind of into walking corpses, in the Icelandic sagas, somebody's corpse gets flat upright in a sled, and the sled somehow becomes airborne. And when I was writing this book, The Old Magic of Christmas, I was like, i got to find that again. Does that have something to do with Santa Claus? I don't know. I was never never able to find it again. Really? Um, hmm. So if, if anybody out there has uh, read the, the saga, the others in their entirety and they've come across this send me a facebook message friend me on facebook because it's really hard to find the messages that people send to you that aren't your facebook friends they like facebook hides them oh yeah yeah which is what happened to us yeah yeah i found messages from like five years ago you know read your book loved it hey do you want to do an interview why aren't you answering me i hate you i'm giving you a bad (laughs) review yeah yeah (laughs) Yeah, so people can find me on Facebook and then send me a message. And I also came across something else, with that, which I thought was maybe a little too mean to put in the book, so I didn't. Um, at one time, the Sami up in Lapland, Lapland, they seem to have had a tradition of uh, when you got like really old, like their father is now, 
and you were no longer a productive member of society, you would voluntarily get on a sled and your family would push you over a cliff. Ooh. So that there, we would briefly have an old guy on a sleigh airborne. Well, hey, there's your Santa in a sleigh. Right there yeah, it is. Yeah, and he was probably like, <laughs> in his best, you know, loppy, lop, Tommy embroidered outfit. So maybe, I don't know, there could be something there. But, you know, actually, our Santa Claus, that's another thing. If, if, um, if, uh, Santa is a shaman and his coat is the bloody skin from a sheep, that's what our Santa looks like. The red coat with the white fur trim. Uh, when he first got here in America, he's wearing brown. Like, if you look at the original illustrations, it was the night before Christmas, he has, like, a, a, a a brown coat, a brown furry coat, and he was probably based on the furry Nicholases in Germany. And the old world, often he does not wear red. He might wear, he originally wore fur, you know, all over fur. And then a lot of the old, like the turn of the century Christmas cards you see from Germany, he's, he's not fat, he's thin, and he'll be wearing a, maybe a blue robe or a brown robe. He looks, he looks more monkish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it wasn't before they got like really good color printing techniques and stuff that that he started showing up in the red. It looks festive. Well, what are some of the other darker stories and spirits that you encountered while writing this book? Because there are some that you wrote about here that are pretty interesting. Well, one of my favorites is the Baborka, who is from what's now Czech Republic mainly Bohemia, which has always been like sort of part Slavic, part German. And she um, she comes on St. Barbara's Day, which is December, the night of December 3rd, I think. I should consult my own little calendar of spirits at the end. Just as a brief advertisement, at the end there's a great... I don't know if it's an addendum or what you actually call it, but it's it's just a great just like a layout of all of the dates of the Christmas season from early November all the way through. Uh, yeah, we start with uh, November 11th, St. Martin's Day. That um, you want to watch out for the wild hunt at that time. Don't get mowed down. Don't be on any remote forest track on November 11th. And then, yes, uh, December 3rd is St. Barbara's Eve, because St. Barbara's Saint Day is uh, December 4th. And so the, the Baborka, which is the, the little Barbara, uh, she goes around. She's usually played by a, a little girl. Probably earlier she was played by a teenager, and she has either her hair hanging in her face or she's completely covered by a, by a veil, and she goes around with a broom or a carpet beater, you know, one of those those pretty wicker carpet beaters. Yeah. And uh, she goes from house to house, and she, she might have a tendency to give out uh, candies for uh, the, the good kids, which is ends up being all the kids. And what I like about her, other than um, she doesn't show her face, she does not. And there's also one in a remote village in Switzerland, um, originally uh, 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 the Christ child. Now, I forget what is she called. She looks like a bride. She's got like this sparkling veil that's completely covering her face. Mm -hmm. And she also does not speak. She has female attendants who talk to the kids, ask them how they've been, hand out candy. But I just love this figure because can you imagine this person comes into your house you can't see her face she's not speaking but you know that she has power of you over you and um that's got to be spooky i know my my 11 year old she still has she the characters and things that, that freak her out even on um there's one on even universe or some character who like doesn't speak or doesn't speak normally the creatures who don't speak. 
I might there's find that some... particular situation to be pretty erotic, to be honest. But uh... oh, really? <laughs> no, I'm totally cool. kidding. I'm totally kidding. I, I but, just oh, okay. uh, yeah. oh really? Oh, I thought that was going to be another episode. But somebody who looks like they ought to be able to look human, looks like they ought to be able to speak, and they don't. Yeah. Because they can't, or they won't, or maybe if they did speak, it would be dangerous for you to hear. I don't know. So I like these these silent winter brides, as I think of them. Yeah. And, Isn't um, there a story in the book about oh, there's a bride that gets like she's playing hide and seek or something? Oh yeah, the mistletoe bride. The mistletoe bride. Yeah. Do you remember that yeah, story? Yeah, the mistletoe bride. The, she was like really dim witted. <laughs> yeah. Girl. Um. Yeah. She. She's in there. If you look on the Llewellyn, my publisher's website, the Llewellyn website, the Llewellyn online journal. If you put my my name in there, I think you can still bring up uh, an article that I wrote on the white ladies. I had originally had, like, all of those white ladies in there, but my editor, my editor likes to keep me on track. Um, she's like, these are not really relevant to Christmas. Um, there's a bunch of stories about... Um, it's not... Uh, in, in, this, in the case of the Mistletoe Bride, she was a bride, and she was married at Christmas time and she wanted to play, she was very young, wanted to play hide and seek after, you know, during the wedding reception and she hid in an old chest and nobody found her <laughs> until, yeah, until generations later. I don't, I don't later know why I find that so funny, but yeah. Cleaning out the house and there she is in, in her wedding dress, the skeleton in her, oh, in her wedding dress. Yeah. The thing is about like these old trunks, okay, if it was a medieval trunk, um, even if it was a trunk from the 1600s, you know, you could spring that lock from inside. <laughs> yeah. Well. You could have gotten out. And it's so widespread. Sometimes it's, um, it's an actress. I think she actually was Elizabeth somebody. She had a name. She was playing Juliet in the, you know, sort of like family production in the castle. And she went inside. They had a chest to be her her sarcophagus and she went in there and I guess the scene, Romeo's scene, dragged on too long. Yeah. And by the time they let her out, she had suffocated. And I think it also shows up in um, the southeastern U.S. I think they have their virgin version. She, I, she, she doesn't have mistletoe. She doesn't have crying mistletoe or anything on there anymore. Hmm. Uh, but I think they've got, you know, the ghost of a girl who was trapped inside a chest voluntarily on her wedding night and figure out how to how to spring the lock or maybe she I, I, well, that would be hard to hit yourself in the head, head with the lid mm-hmm. on the way in yeah it's contrived but people find this very very um, you know wouldn't they have turned the house upside down looking for this girl nobody thinks it was the most obvious hiding place but the thing is that she was a bride and I think she goes very well with Christmas because Christmas is the reason why Christmas was such a dangerous time is because and you know we have that whole thing the 12 days of Christmas which actually don't begin until Christmas Day itself or yeah. after Christmas because that's then bridging the gap those 12 days bridge the gap from the old year into the new year and when you're ever you're moving from one place in time to another place in time or one state of being to another there's going to be a crack that you might accidentally fall into everything becomes unstable and that's why there's all these 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 rules like you know don't wash your don't do laundry during the 12 days of christmas don't polish the brass during the 12 days of christmas stay inside don't look out the window because it is a dangerous time and brides also were in a dangerous kind of state because, you know, well, in those days, theoretically, you're a virgin, and then on your wedding morning, you're no longer a virgin, but then that time when you're wearing your wedding dress, the priest says, you've taken your vows, 
you're having the party, but you haven't gone to bed yet. Well, what are you? Are you still a maiden? Are you still a girl, a child? Or are you now really fully fledged a wife? You're kind of not because if marriage wasn't consummated, then it could be dissolved. And so you're in this sort of unstable place. And marriage, I think originally, marriage was, you know, in days when people didn't live very long, especially the, the women who would either die, die in childbirth or die in a kitchen fire when they're, you know, dress caught fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think marriage was ever meant to be for a person's entire lifetime. I think originally it was a rite of passage. And for the man, it wasn't so, it wasn't, I think, as intense a rite of passage as it was for the woman, because the woman, something, you know, very physical and bloody was about to happen to her. It was it was considered a dangerous state of being to be a bride. Right. And, and I think, and brides are traditionally very restless ghosts. Like wait a minute, I was you know I was in the middle of something. I was between two things. You know what happened? So that's why. And and often sometimes if a girl died before she could get married, she would be buried in her wedding dress. And this is like in medieval and early you know early projects in England. She would be buried in her wedding dress, and her funeral would be treated as a wedding. So I guess she wouldn't come back looking. To say, hey, where's my where's my special day? And and the Chinese also, I don't know if they still do, but they used to like if if a, a girl in the family, an unmarried girl in the family died, they would try to find a groom for her, and they would even like leave money on the sidewalk. <laughs> and if the man came by and picked up the money, then they would jump out and say, oh. That was the that was the bride price you just took, and and you, Sonny, are coming along for the wedding, and they would have a wedding feast, and he was the groom, and then the ghost of the daughter was considered to be married off, and she wouldn't trouble anybody. Wasn't there a story in yeah. the book too about, um, you know, like stuffing a Christmas rose into your blouse, and then if. Like, if a man came and plucked it out, like, he was going to be your husband or something? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, there's a lot of fortune-telling going on. Right. Um, at Christmas time. Yeah. So, so yeah, if you want to, if you are looking for a suitor, wear a low-cut blouse, stuff a Christmas <laughs> rose in it, and if yeah. a man comes by and plucks it out, he's he's your guy. And now it has to be a proper Christmas rose. Can we talk about Harry Potter? Yes, please. And the Deathly Hallows. Um, I think it was my Facebook friend Katie Strange who went who went on and 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 confirmed. Yes, yeah, she sent me the scene where they go to Godric's Hollow, and in the movie, uh, Hermione conjures, I think, a wreath of roses to put on the grave roses as in just regular roses but in the book i think jk rowling says christmas roses and a christmas rose is not the same thing at all as a regular rose it's just a white rose it's a completely different plant entirely it's um not all that easy to get around here i know the uh, reeves reed arboretum which is near me they have some hellebore it's actually black hellebore they have a different kind of hellebore growing there and my sister at one time brought us all um christmas potted christmas roses as christmas presents which i i died but i can't have it anymore because it's had it is poisonous it's a very pretty flower it has sort of iridescent petals it doesn't look anything like a rose at all um and that blooms around christmas time in, in the alps and in in Pennsylvania, in the, the you know from among the Pennsylvania Dutch, they used to watch it on Christmas Eve because it was supposed to the flowers were just open on Christmas Eve, and that was like you know just sort of a thing. So you you don't see them much around here, but in um, in Germany, the the Christmas roses they're on the napkins, they're uh, on the wrapping paper, on the Christmas cards, uh, and I I like them as a one of your more obscure. Christmas herbs. 
and they may have been used, the, the, the root may have been used uh, to treat bubonic plague victims, and it has special significance for that old, that old goddess again that she keeps popping up just like the wild hunt, um, Bertha, uh, otherwise known as Bertha, or Bertha, that was mm-hmm. a special, special flower of hers because it bloomed during her, her season in the winter. Yeah, so if you're going to do the thing, well, but actually, no, but that one was, a, that thing was English, wasn't it? Putting the rose. Uh, yeah, I mean, and it wasn't, that yeah, was, it wasn't. I think that one means, that one I think is just an ordinary white rose. Yeah, because yeah, there was, I mean, there was three variations of the Christmas rose listed in the book. Yeah, all completely different plants. So, okay, so for finding the suitor, you want to stick, to, so, so use the regular rose for the prognostication to find your suitor. But if you if you don't have a cat, everybody, please go out, and if you're getting a point set anyway, look for a black hellebore, a hellebores niger, at your greenhouse, and have, have one as part of your Christmas decorations, because I think that they are neglected and underappreciated in America. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I pulled it up online just to see what they look like, and they're very beautiful flowers. Yeah, yeah, and they have, like, when you look, it's probably hard to see in a picture, but in real life, when the, when the sun is on them, the petals have that nice sort of sparkly iridescent. I've got Rosa Alba, a white rose, for finding your suitor. And I, yeah, here, I recommended a damask or gallica rose, one of those old-fashioned those old fashioned breed. I don't know what they call like you know when you can get a dozen roses at the gas station. <laughs> yeah. I don't know exactly what. Yeah, what variety is that? I don't know. I doubt it's this very rare Christmas rose that we don't see much of here. I, it's probably just. Yeah, a, no, but I don't yeah. think it's even. I don't think it's even a you know like a proper tea rose. I think. It's, oh well, I mean, know. yeah. If you're getting them in a gas station, it's probably not a proper rose at all. Well, no, I think it's, it's an actual rose, as roses go. And then the Swiss have that other rose. The, um, okay, here it goes. Anastatica hierohuntica. Oh, very good. <laughs> Which I think you can actually find that, like, you know, in the back of Smithsonian or so, you know, those little ads that they have, mm-hmm. um, usually built as a resurrection plant. And that's a desert plant that you just sort of add water and, watch it grow but you would think it would be more of an easter thing uh but they do it at um in switzerland they do it on christmas eve you actually have like i don't know i should write a book that's sort of like the one one herb for each of the you know from december 1st to the 25th like sort of an advent calendar of roses did you do advent calendars when you were growing up no no i did not no oh advantage yeah there's the two kinds you know there's the kind that has a picture behind each door or if you're really unlucky a biblical verse behind each door then there's the kind that has chocolate <laughs> right behind each door. yeah 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 you know wait you know we may have done that when i was really young i don't remember no so one more quick question here for you you know we were talking about some of the darker side of christmas a few minutes ago there's a lot of dark spirits in the book. What can we do to protect ourselves during this time of year from them? Um, I have a couple. Cause, well, you know, I think a lot of the people who pick up this book won't want to protect themselves. Uh, this book is more written for people who want to invite them in. Oh, okay. okay. So I've kind of written it for how to invite them in. As far as, you know, going along, um, the, my, my favorite chapter to write were the two kind of two chapters, the one on the elves, uh, the, the Dead by Christmas Morning chapter, and uh, At Home with the Elves. So I said, if you, if you want elves to come in, and the thing about elves is they will come in. <laughs> That's been, you know, in, throughout folklore, they will come in. In, mm. in Iceland, it's, it's always the person who's left home alone. There's always got to be somebody who has to be left home alone while the rest of the family goes to church on Christmas Eve and then these these strange 
people in old-fashioned clothes just kind of bust in and start dancing. And the trick seems to be not to speak, either not to speak them, to them directly. If you are going to speak to them, you dress them respectfully. If you want them to come in, make the house so that it's, you know, you don't want bright, glaring lights. You don't want loud music. You want candlelight, soft, twinkly lights quietness. In in Iceland, Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve are often the time when the elves are said to move house and they may pass through their house. So make it nice for them. Make, maybe they want to sit on the sofa and put up their feet for a while. Uh, there's also some scary stories from Newfoundland that I found. There's a book called Strange Terrain by Barbara Ricci and she records fairy lore in Newfoundland and there's some scary stories about people who accidentally build their homes on elf paths and the elves get very upset when their their way is blocked. Apparently elves aren't good at going around things. So you might want to put some lights and some offerings outside the house to kind of guide them around it if you don't want them coming inside. And the other thing is you do, whether whether uh, whether you're expecting Santa Claus or that you think your Norwegian ancestor may have, when he came to America, may have brought uh, the family um, household spirit with him. You would want to put a parge outside or up in the bowl of parge outside or up in the attic. And I have a, there's a recipe for that in the book. Um, there's also a flying boar that you could put fish heads out for. You need to put something out for someone on Christmas Eve, and and you should be all good. Well, Linda, that is a great note, I think, to wrap this up on. I have to tell you so much. I enjoyed your book so much. It put me in the Christmas spirit. I enjoyed this conversation immensely. You're so knowledgeable, and I would love to get back together maybe around Walpurgis Night and talk about that. Yeah, that would be fun. That would be good. Hopefully, I will have my next book out by then. What's it about? I kind of, I've been writing it accidentally. It's it's a fantasy novel, but it reads like a visitor's guide to an old castle. Ooh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'm doing it through, publishing it through Amazon because, who would touch that, right? What publisher would touch, touch that? <laughs> yeah, the uh, uh, Create Space platform, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. Create Space, right? So that'll be something new for me. Awesome. Well, I look forward to it. I would love to to check that out when it comes out. You'll have to let me know. Yes, I will definitely, definitely. Yes, this has been fun. Thank you, thank you for remembering me. Uh, even though the book is three years old. You know, hey, if I was doing this three years ago, I would have definitely called you up to talk about it. But uh, I, I'm i a little late on it. But I thought still, you know, the lessons in there, the stories in there, uh, it's it's still pertinent, obviously. And if anybody wants to read the book, buy the book, I mean, it's on Amazon. It's also available through the publisher's website, Llewellyn, like you said. Is there any place else that people can keep up with your work? Do you have any sort of social media that you'd like people to follow or a blog um, or anything? No, like, no. My my idol is an author called Helen Oyeyemi. Um, her first book was called Icarus Girl. It's uh, Anglo-African realistic fiction ghost novel. I really like her stuff. And she's, I don't know, she's like 30. And she's written more than five books. And one of her interviews viewers said, like, you know that you're not, you don't really have an internet presence. And she said, well, I have only so much time. I could, you know, I could tweet or I could write books. So I choose to write books. I do uh, I do have a Facebook page. People can find me on there. And that's it for me. Yeah, that's... To be honest, you're probably better off not being so intertwined in the internet world, the social media world. It can get pretty uh, hectic out there, so... Yeah, it's just too much. Just yeah, too absolutely. Much. I wish I wasn't so involved in it myself, but, you know, trying to promote a podcast, you kind of have to be, so. Kind of have to be, yeah, yeah. All right, Linda, and your last name is Radish, right? Is that how you say that? Yeah, you pronounce that good, too, yeah. Radish. All right, Linda Radish, hey, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your time. Uh, happy holidays to you and your family, and I'll yeah. talk to you soon, hopefully. 
Okay, great. Merry Christmas. All right. My thanks again to Linda Radish. If you're interested in the old magic of Christmas, there's a link to purchase it in the show notes. And my thanks to all of you who chose to spend a few minutes of your time during this busy holiday season with us. If you're a current subscriber to the show, be on the lookout for some bonus material with Linda coming up in the next couple of weeks. If you're not a current subscriber, why the hell aren't you? Anyways, this is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, question authority, and don't ever stop believing in that Christmas magic. Please rewind this cassette.